Jeremiah, moving from your hope to God's, your despair to God's hope. But before we go there, let me invite you to open your Bibles with me to the book of Psalms. Psalm 40. Psalm 40. Is there anyone here who is discouraged today? You don't have to raise your hand. Maybe feeling in despair. Life's been tough lately. Let me remind you what our Lord said in this world, you shall suffer what? Tribulations. And perhaps this is how you're feeling. Maybe you're going through an unwanted separation or divorce. Or perhaps you've lost your job, or maybe you've lost your mate. I saw Dan Dybel here, as you know. His mate went home to be with the Lord a few months ago. Or perhaps you have a mate that's in decline physically. Or maybe you have a wayward child who's going down some very bad, dead-end streets. Or perhaps you've been falsely accused, you know, like Tom Hanna here, experienced a house fire and been accused of being an arson. When his wife told me he's a hero, he took our kids out of that house in time. Maybe you're experiencing some real injustice, or maybe you're coping with the anguish of a homosexual son or daughter. Or maybe you have a serious medical condition, or perhaps a disability. Or maybe a child with a disability like I have. I met a guy today who has a similar trial in his life. Perhaps you're dealing with the death of a loved one. Or perhaps it's even one of your children, how difficult it is for parents to bury their children instead of vice versa. And dear men, these are trials and sufferings that we face in this world. But why are there trials and suffering? There isn't a space for this, but if you just want to listen, we know from the scriptures. First of all, it's because of Satan. The book of Job brings that out, and Mike Lehman brought that out this morning, as well as it's due to original sin, the sin that Adam and Eve committed, Adam in particular, that plunged the world into the curse. Sometimes it's due to other sin as people sin against us and we experience suffering because of it. And sometimes it's due to our own sins. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and we, whoever, whatever man sows, that shall he also reap. Sometimes it's suffering for righteousness sake. For doing what's right before the Lord, we end up paying a price. Sometimes it's due to the sovereign purposes of God that we don't always understand, but like Joseph uttered in the face of the death of his dad as his brothers were wondering what would happen now, he said, though they meant it for evil, God meant it for good. And in some cases, there may be other reasons why, but I do know that Sometimes you feel just like this guy right here. You're in despair. You're not sure what to do. You're not sure where, where to go. The roof is caving in. You feel trapped. You see, some suffering is deserved suffering, while other tribulation and afflictions you experience are undeserved, like Job. And frankly, men, trials and sufferings that are undeserved can be very difficult, but they're even more difficult when you know they could have been avoided and they were due to your sinful choices. Perhaps due to your pride when we thought we could handle it or we had to do it our way instead of the Lord's. Or perhaps due to our unbelief when we thought we'd be the exception to the rule or that we could control the consequences, or maybe due to our rebellion when we deliberately violated the word of God, but we didn't care or we justified our disobedience somehow. And now our sins have found us out. Now we're reaping what we have sown, and it's painful, it's heavy. 
the joy has been robbed. And if we pin the tail on the right donkey, we have to pin it on ourselves. Maybe your sins are destroying your marriage. Maybe, you're, you, maybe they've landed you in jail. Maybe you've, they've ruined your testimony. Maybe your kids think you are an outright hypocrite. Maybe you're struggling with an addiction, perhaps to drugs, maybe to porn. Maybe you sense the heavy chastening hand of God upon your life. And don't forget that even under grace, whom the Lord loves, he what? He chastens. You've sowed the wind and now you're reaping the whirlwind. You've lost the joy of your salvation, though you can't lose the security of it. You've wandered far away from the Lord, or maybe you've taken what you thought was going to be a short detour, and you've traveled that carnal road for a lot longer than you anticipated. And if you're honest with yourself before the Lord, you know you have no one to blame but yourself. So you're wondering, is there still any, still any hope for me? Has God forsaken me? Is there any relief and escape from the guilt and the pain I feel? Is God through with me? Can I ever enjoy deep fellowship with the Lord again? Or can I ever be used by him again? And perhaps Satan is using some means to whisper in your ear saying, you will always only be a failure. You're a loser. Why even try? Just hang up the Christian life. You're going to heaven, so who cares how you live in the meantime? And you're discouraged at best and you're in despair at worst. Where do you turn in a time like that? Can you ever recover your focus and consistent fellowship with the Lord? And if so, how? And you see, before we turn to Lamentations 3 and answer those very questions, there in Psalm 40 where you are turned. Look with me at verse 1. In fact, let's read it all together. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. Notice, where did he turn? He turned to who? The Lord. Turn to the Lord. I waited patiently for the Lord. He didn't turn to a bottle. He didn't turn to a drug. He didn't turn to a other human relationship. He turned to the Lord. And observe next how he waited patiently for the Lord to resolve the problem instead of taking it into his own hands. And this took trust, simple trust in the Lord to do for him what he could never do for himself. And notice next how he prayed about his need. And he inclined to me and he heard my cry. He prayed about it. He brought it to the Lord. And by the way, when you bring it to God, you're bringing your situation to the one person in the universe who can do something really about it. Isn't it funny how we can share it or turn to other people and gotta spend three hours explaining our problems and not spend three minutes praying about them. And God, as your heavenly Father, wants to answer your prayers. And what did he do? Verse 2. Let's read it all together. He also brought me up That's incredible. He brought me up out of the horrible pit, could be translated slimy pit, out of the miry clay. And what did he do? He set my feet upon a rock and he established my steps. Men, sometimes God removes us from the trials or the sufferings, while sometimes he gives us sufficient grace to go through it and learn from it and become transformed like Christ because of it. And instead of remaining in the pit, God set my feet upon a rock, a place of stability and security. That's just what's needed in our life. Because when someone's in this condition, their emotions are all over the map. And you notice he established my steps. 
gave him a firm foundation and direction for your, my life. And that's exactly what he needed. And that's why, brothers in Christ, are you tired of the slimy pit? Are you tired of the miry clay? There's still hope. Romans 8, 28 is still true. And God can set your feet upon the rock. He can establish your steps. He can replace the despair with hope, the guilt with peace, the sadness with real joy, the aimlessness with real direction, though some or many of the consequences may still remain. Are you interested in how God can do that? If the answer is yes, turn next with me to Lamentations chapter 3. Lamentations chapter 3. It's that little five-chapter book snuggled between Isaiah, Jeremiah, then Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And since the text without a context is a pretext, let's consider, first of all, some background to Lamentations number, chapter 3. Number one, the author of the book of Lamentations was the prophet Jeremiah around the year 586 B.C. Interesting, the name of the book is Lamentations. What a title for a book, unlike the other books which are usually named after the prophet Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obed. Lamentations. And by the way, what is a lament? It's a passionate expression of grief or sorrow. It means to wail or weep like in a funeral procession. What a name for a book. How many people will say, man, I can't read, wait to read Lamentations. Sounds as exciting as going to the dentist to get a root canal. But remember, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, including lamentations, and all scripture is profitable, including lamentations, for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. Now, what's significant about the year 586 B.C.? Anyone know? What's significant about that? Gibbs students, you know? If you don't, you're done with Gibbs. Okay? Well, we know it's when the Babylonian captivity came to completion. And it kicked off, as it were, in 605, but it was completed in 586. And there were 70 years of the Babylonian captivity promised by God in the Old Testament to, in essence, make up for the 77-year Sabbath years that they forsook, and God says, I'm going to collect one day, and he did. And as a result, there were these 70 years of Babylonian captivity, in which there was a complete conquering of the Jews and Israel by Babylon. You see, 586 to a Jewish historian today would be like December 7th, 1941, to a World War II buff. One commentator writes, and I quote, the anguish of that event could never be forgotten either in the depth of its suffering or in its disturbing implications. And so the book of Lamentations is written about 586 B.C. and written by who? Jeremiah, the faithful but weeping prophet. You see, Jeremiah was called by God to be a prophet to Judah, after the ten northern tribes had already been taken captive by the Assyrians in 722 B.C. And God told Jeremiah that he would be a mouthpiece for God, though the bulk of Israel would reject his message and ministry. And yet, by the grace of God, he accepted the will of God and the call of God and was a faithful prophet of God in an apostate land of Judah, characterized by idolatry and immorality. And yet, Jeremiah faithfully preached God's message and was mostly rejected by the people. And in fact, he was even greatly persecuted, yet he relied on the Lord and he remained faithful as God's prophet for 40 years. But Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet because he loved the Lord and he loved his fellow Jews and 
He told them God's truth, and they didn't merely reject Jeremiah. More importantly, they rejected the Lord. And based upon Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, Jeremiah knew that God had promised five cycles of discipline to the, his chosen earthly people if they did not obey his word. In an effort to get their attention, cycle one, he would send disease, weather, and death. If they would not respond, he would send more discipline that include physical distress, being plundered, and oppression. And then if they didn't respond, cycle three, there was a rejection by God from covenant fellowship. And then four, cycle four, they would be invaded, conquered, and brutalized by your enemies. And then ultimately, deprived of all the benefits, disease, and disasters in the land, and deportation from the land, including dispersion. And that's exactly what happened in 586. You know why? Because God always keeps his word, both positively and negatively. We like the positive, we don't like the negative, but he's faithful either way. And Jeremiah is the weeping prophet because he's weeping as he beholds Jerusalem. He's weeping over his chosen pe God's chosen people. He's weeping at those who had rejected God's word and rejected his ministry. And by the way, that's one of the things you have to get used to when you're involved in pastoral ministry. There's going to be a certain amount of weeping. A pastor friend of mine is soon to retire told me, after all these years of pastoral ministry, he says, it's really taken an emotional toll on him. Still wants to be involved in ministry, just not senior pastor ministry. And I get it. I find myself from time to time just weeping, praying, letting the Lord encourage me as I think of believers I know, the fact that this one just heard they're going to have can they have cancer. This one here is going through a divorce. This one here is separated. This one here is this. In some cases, they're undermining pastoral authority even here at DBC. And my heart weeps. People I love, people I care about, people in some cases I've led to the Lord I taught the word of God. That's why you have to find your strength in the Lord. You have to do what you do is on to the Lord. You have to remember his grace. Jeremiah found strength, and we're going to find out how he did. And he found hope, and he shared that hope with us. For you see, men, the historical context of Lamentations is the aftermath of the Babylonian invasion and the horrific destruction of Jerusalem is recorded in 2 Kings 25, Jeremiah 39 and 52. It is a scene of incredible personal and national suffering. It was a horrific scene as idolatry flourished, as people cried out to any god to deliver them from the Babylonians. It was a horrific scene of paranoia that gripped the people, and they even tried to murder Jeremiah, though God protected him, accusing him of being a traitor and a spy, for he predicted what would happen. It was a horrific scene of famine, ravishing the land and starving mothers who began to eat their own children to survive. It was a horrific scene of women of all ages being raped and killed, and many men were put to death. It was a scene in which Jewish princes were publicly hung and executed. And where the temple and the walls of Jerusalem were destroyed and were in ruins. And the priests and the false prophets were slain in the sanctuary. And the majority of those who survived then were deported to Babylon to be dispersed as slaves. And who predicted this all? Who observed this all? Who wept over this all? Who lamented over all this? Jeremiah, who wrote Lamentations. And though Israel experienced deserved suffering, Jeremiah still loved God's people. He deeply grieved over the destruction he experienced and the death he observed. And he's led by the Holy Spirit to write this book titled Lamentations. Just five chapters. And you see, 
And then the structure of the book consists of five lament poems. They're the five chapters. Utilizing the Hebrew acrostic of all 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet per chapter, with chapter 3 being the pivotal chapter as it utilizes this alphabetic acrostic three times in its 66 verses. You say, well, what do you mean? Well, in the Hebrew alphabet, there are 22 letters. Each verse in each of the four chapters, 1, 2, 4, and 5, each verse begins with a different letter in the Hebrew alphabet. It starts out with Aleph and then Ayin and Beth and so forth, and it just works its way right on down. So if you look at Lamentations chapter 1, how many verses? 22. Chapter 2, how many verses? 22. Chapter 3, how many verses? 66. Chapter 4, how many verses? 22. Chapter 5, how many verses? 22. Why? Because there's 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Each verse begins with a different Hebrew letter. Why did they do that? For memorization's sake. For a poetic structure and such. And you see, according to Chuck Swindoll in his book chart on Lamentations, chapter 1 the underlying his motion is he's lonely and he's groaning. And he's in essence saying, see us. So look at Lamentations 1 and verse 1. How lonely sits the city that was full of people. How like a widow is she who was great among the nations. The princess among the provinces has become a slave. Verse 5, her adversaries have become the master. Her enemies prosper, for the Lord has afflicted her because of the multitude of her transgressions. Her children have gone into captivity before the enemy. You know, it's one thing when people touch our lives. It's another thing when they touch our children's lives. In chapter 2, he moves from Jerusalem's desolation to the Lord's anger. And the underlying emotion is one of angry and exhorting. Look at chapter 2 and verse 14 here. 2.14. Your prophets have seen for you false and deceptive visions. They have not uncovered your iniquity to bring back your captives, but have envisioned for you false prophecies and delusions. Notice, they told you what you wanted to hear instead of what you needed to hear, and that's a lot of preaching today. And notice, they did not uncover your iniquity. One of the responsibilities of the pastor as he teaches the word of God is to uncover your sins, to point them out. Not so you would be sin-focused, but you would be God-focused, but recognize that these sins have a destructive element to your fellowship and to your life, so that you would truly repent of your sins as a believer and yield to the Lord and walk in fellowship with him. And they failed to do that. Verse 17 goes on to say, The Lord has done what he purposed. He has fulfilled his word, which he commanded in days of old. He has thrown down and has not pitied. He has caused an enemy to rejoice over you, namely the Babylonians. He has exalted the horn of your adversaries. Now, chapter 3, we're going to see Jeremiah's grief in a little bit. We'll examine in detail. The emotion is one of broken and weeping. And we'll see the key verses in a little bit. Chapter 4 moves again to the Lord's anger. Here now, there's, he's desperate, he's anguished. He's saying, in essence, avenge us. Look at chapter 4, verse 11. Chapter 4, verse 11. The Lord has fulfilled his fury. He has poured out his fierce anger. He kindled a fire in Zion, and it has devoured its foundations. Verse 12, the kings of the earth and all inhabitants of the world would not have believed that the adversary and the enemy could enter the gates of Jerusalem. 
Why? Because God had protected them over the years. And in that protection, they fell asleep and they began to think, well, we have the temple. Therefore, we're not going to be adversely affected. How many Christian men have thought, well, we took the vows, we said, till death do us part, I don't really have to worry and I don't really have to invest in my marriage. And what a mistake. And then chapter 5, we see Jeremiah's prayer and he's weary and he's pleading with the Lord. And we pick it up in chapter 5 and verse 5. They pursue at our heels, we labor, and we have no rest. Verse 19. You, O Lord, remain forever your throne from generation to generation. Why do you forget us forever and forsake us for so long a time? Turn us back to you, O Lord, and we will be restored. Renew our days as of old, unless you have utterly rejected us and are very angry with us. What a way to end a book. Man, imagine if we ended a sermon that way. People would say, man, you are just a discouraging preacher. Can't you lie, uh, end on a high note a little? But he's really leaving them with the sense of are you going to turn to the Lord or not? Another person has diagrammed all this like on your handout there. Chapter 1, views of the city, it's an outside view. Chapter 2, the wrath of God, it's an inside view. Chapter 3, the compassions of God, it's an upward view. Chapter 4, the sins of all classes, it's an overall view. And chapter 5 is a prayer and it's a future view. And I'll tell you, one of the things that really comes out through this whole book is the sovereignty of God, the faithfulness of God, the compassions of God, the mercies of God, in view of the sin of man. You see, dear men, the focal point of chapter 3 and of the whole book is found in chapter 3, where we can go to now, verses 21 through 24. And perhaps you know these verses, you've heard them, but maybe not in their context. 321 through 24, let's read them all together, should we? This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. Now notice again, we're focusing now on the Lord. And when we start to focus on the Lord, what does he have? Therefore, I hope in him. Therefore, I have hope. Before he had despair, and now he has hope. But why does he have hope? And that's where the key word that's repeated three times in this section is the word hope, which is due to God's mercies. It's the Hebrew word hesed or kesed. It's found approximately 250 times in the Old Testament. And it's kind of a difficult word to translate, but it means loyal or steadfast love. His, his loyal compassion, his steadfast grace, his faithfulness, his goodness. And by the way, it's translated in all those different kinds of ways. Someone has said that Hesed is that love that will not let you go. It's found in many verses in the Old Testament. For example, Psalm 103 and verse 4, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with hesed, loving kindness. And oftentimes with it, you'll see the word compassion. He not only redeems your life, he crowns it. And you know this verse, or this word in Psalm 23, verse 6, surely goodness and, here it is, mercy, shall follow me all the days of my life. And if you think that's pretty impressive, I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now that's really impressive. 
Psalm 25 and verse 6, let's say it all together. Remember your mercy. They've been from old. This is the way God is. He's a God of mercy. He's a God of steadfast love. Even when we're not faithful, yet he abides faithful. He cannot deny himself. Here's another one. Let's say it together. Isaiah 63, verse 7. I will mention Now, this word kessed is found twice in this verse. It's translated loving kindness at the beginning, and it's translated loving kindness later as well. It's that Old Testament word for loyal love and grace. Now, that can encourage the discouraged. That can lift up the downtrodden. That can take you from the miry pit and put your feet on a solid rock again, amen? When you think about the mercies, the grace, the compassions, the faithfulness of God, and that's what helped Jeremiah in his time of despair, and that's what's going to help you as well. And that's why, having considered some crucial background to Jeremiah, or to Lamentations, I should say, we're prepared to devote the remainder of our study to contemplate some critical biblical principles and applications to move you from despair to hope in your trials and suffering. And what's incredible about this is they're right in the text. For you to read over and over again, for you to meditate upon time and time again, for you to even memorize, for you to both hear and heed and not do the spiritual gargle in the parking lot on the way home. They're right here. If you want to move from despair to hope, you need to listen to what Jeremiah says. The first thing we note is he frankly faced his sufferings. He faced them intellectually and emotionally, as well as the sufferings of others, instead of ignoring or denying them, and so should you. Don't stick your head in the sand. Jeremiah didn't live in fantasy land. He lived on reality island. And that's why chapter 3 is filled with the word he and his, referring to God, and I and me, referring to the prophet, over and over again in this chapter. In fact, look at how the chapter begins. Lamentations 3 and verse 1. I am the man who has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. I'm the man. But not in the way we usually, he's the man. No, 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 not in that way. I'm the man who has seen affliction. I observed it firsthand. I've seen it on a personal level. I've seen it on a family level. I've seen it, yea, on a national level. And you know, obviously, many of us are concerned about the condition of our country and the direction it's going. And frankly, my objective in life is not to make America great again. You want to wear a hat like that? That's between you and the Lord. But that's not what it's about. It's about being a faithful ambassador to the Lord. Whatever happens to our country, we're not here to polish the brass rails on the sinking ship. We're here to lead the lost to Christ. We're here to see Christ build his church. And yeah, I love our country. I cry during the national anthem almost always. My wife and I do. Because we love our country. It's meant so much to us. And we're concerned about our kids. We're concerned about our grandkids. And it's changed, no question. It's changed dramatically. And Jeremiah saw this in his land. Now, if you notice closely, I'm not even going to read the verse. I just want you to see. I put the verse in here. See what's predominant? He has led me. He has turned his hand against me. He has aged my flesh and my skin. He has beseeched me. He has set me in dark places. 
He has hedged me in so that I cannot get out. He has made my chain heavy, even when I cry and shout. He shuts out my prayer. He has blocked my ways with hewn stone. He has made my paths crooked. He has been to me a, a bare lion in wait, like a lion in ambush. He, 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 he. You have moved my soul far from peace. I have forgotten prosperity. You see, as Jeremiah looks around, he recognizes the sovereign hand of God and how it has affected others, including himself. Now, sometimes in reading this, we can get the wrong impression. We can begin to think that God is this cosmic killjoy. He wants to rain on our parade, and he can't wait in his anger to, to punish us. But the fact of the matter is, as a believer in Christ, he's already punished his son on our behalf. And he's been propitiated, satisfied with the death of Christ, so he's willing to save all who are willing to put their faith in Christ alone, who died for our sins and rose again. And God does not punish his children today. Whom the Lord loves, he doesn't punish, he disciplines. Punish is punitive. Punish relates to justice. Discipline relates to love. But remember, we're dealing here with an Old Testament people group, God's chosen people who God designed to bring the Messiah through the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And by the way, we reject replacement theology. We don't believe the church has replaced Israel. We believe the promises made to Israel in the Old Testament will be literally fulfilled in the future when Jesus returns again. Not for his saints, but with his saints. For we are the church made up of Jews and Gentiles who become one in the body of Christ. So we recognize the difference, but what we're Acknowledging in this chapter is that Jeremiah sees God as sovereign. And as sovereign, you must understand there's a perfect will of God and there is a permissive will of God. And I say that because there are Calvinists today who think everything is the perfect will of God. And as a result, the lady that was raped last night, that was God's perfect will. And it makes God out to be a monster. In fact, it blurs the line between good and bad. Because was that rape good or bad? And we would say, well, that was bad. Well, if God decreed it, how could God be decreeing something bad? So I guess that must be good, or is it good? And now the line between good and evil becomes very blurred. And one thing that's very clear from Lamentations is the judgment that came upon Israel of something they deserved because of their disobedience, though God is the one who brought it in his sovereign plan as he had promised them, obey and you'll be blessed, disobey and you will be cursed. But he's acknowledging God's sovereignty in this matter. And what were his conclusions as he walked by sight, feelings, and human viewpoint? Verse 18, and I said, my strength and my hope have perished from the Lord. Remember my affliction and roaming, the wormwood and the gall. My soul still remembers and it sinks within me. You ever had that sinking feeling? When the divorce papers came? When you heard the news of the death of a child? Your church was going through a split or something else. And why is he thinking this way? Why is he concluding this? Because he has a wrong focus and he has a lack of faith. In contrast, Romans 15, 13 says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace through believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. But Jeremiah faces his sufferings. Are you facing yours? He's not only facing them, he's asking God to show him how to look at them correctly. And in doing so, Jeremiah then openly confessed his own sins. And that of Israel's, instead of covering them as contributing factors in his personal 
and national suffering. And so should you when applicable. Now there is a verse here that clearly the godly in Judah didn't bring this upon them. But he acknowledges over and over again the sin of Israel that brought this destruction and devastation and national disaster to Israel. I'm just going to run through them quickly. Jeremiah 1, 8 and 9. Jerusalem has sinned gravely. Later he says her uncleanness is in her skirts. That's a little idiom for immorality. She did not consider her destiny. And by the way, is that not true? When people get involved in immorality, let's say you're, a person's having an affair. They don't think about their destiny. They don't think about how this is all going to turn out. Or if they do, they've hardened their heart and they don't care. They think it's worth the thrill, though it's a rubber cigar that's going to blow up in their face. That's Israel. Lamentations 1.14, the yoke of my transgressions was bound. Notice he's owning his sin. Lamentations 1.18 the Lord is righteous, for I rebelled against his commandment. I like how the ESV translates this. The Lord is in the right, for I rebelled against his word. How often do you say the Lord is in the right, I'm wrong? Or are we prone to justify what we've done? Chapter 1, verse 20. For I have been very rebellious, he says. Lamentations 2.14. Again, your prophets have seen for you false and deceptive visions, they have not uncovered your iniquity. Lamentations 2.17, he has fulfilled his word which he commanded in days of old. Lamentations 3.39, why should a living man complain, a man for the punishment of his sins? Isn't it funny how sometimes our kids complain when they simply reap what they've sowed as if they don't deserve it? Chapter 4, verse 6, the punishment of the iniquity of the daughter of my people is greater than the punishment of the sin of Sodom. Notice, he's acknowledging, he is sinning, he's acknowledging the Israelites have rebelled against God and because of the sins of her prophets and the iniquities of her priests who shed in her midst the blood of the just, da 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 da, da. So notice, our fathers sinned and are no more, but we bear their iniquities. And that is one of the hard things, is it not? Dads, that in some cases your children are bearing the consequences of your iniquities, though they still have a volition. And that's why, listen to this verse. Arise, cry out in the night, the beginning of the watches. Pour out your heart like water before the face of the Lord. Lift your hands toward him for the life of your young children who faint from hunger at the head of every street. And now when you know that it's your sin, your disobedience, your rebellion, your pride that has caused your, your family to suffer, oh, that's hard. That's hard. And one of the difficulties I have seen is on the one hand you have people who embrace a false guilt and they admit they've sinned even when they haven't. And they're always walking around just guilt-ridden. And then I've seen on the other hand, and in fact, I've seen this probably more than the other, everybody's spiritual today, aren't they? They're spiritual, but their marriage is going down the tubes. They're, they're all spiritual, but they have violated the word of God. They're all in fellowship, but they're not loving their wife, or they're not respecting their husband, or they're not responding in a forgiving way, and they're not asking, how did I contribute to this problem? Instead, they're all just spiritual. And you know what I think? I think Jeremiah's right. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know. And we all have blind spots, don't we? But you see, one of the reasons... Jeremiah was able to get beyond his despair as he faced the situation realistically and he admitted where he was wrong. Are you willing to do that? 
For you see, he who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. And that's what God says. Now, this isn't for salvation. This is for fellowship with the Lord. Now, there's a third thing we need to note in Lamentations 3. It's what I would call the turning point. Sounds like a radio broadcast or something. The turning point. Where is it found? It's found right in verse 21. Look there. This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. That's the turning point, man. It's when Jeremiah shifted his focus from considering his own miseries to God's mercies and loyal love, which then led him to have hope. This I recall to my mind. By the way, in the Hebrew, the word this is emphatic. This is the principle. This is the truth. I recall. I remember. And it's causative. This is the reason Jeremiah has hope, because he recalls to my mind. Now notice, he's not going by sight right now. He's not going by his feelings, because you see, the Christian life today, like then, is lived between your ears. You are what you think, and you spill what you're filled with. That's what Mike Lehman said today. So true. Though he acknowledges these emotions, they're real. He's not stuffing them. He's not saying, I'm a man. I don't have feelings. Not at all. He's acknowledging his feelings. But he's making a choice to believe in the person and promises of God. And therefore, I have hope. A reason to have a positive outlook of blessing in my future. And this came when nothing looked possible, hopeful, worthwhile, or comforting. But I want you to just look with me here at verses 21 through 26. And I want you to just notice this. Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. See, life is all about your focus, not your circumstances. It's all about your perspective, not merely about what you are experiencing. It can either operate under human viewpoint or divine viewpoint, and you can either view your circumstances without God's person and word factored in, or you can view your circumstances through the lens of God's word. And you can say, now where is the Lord? What does the Lord say? What does he want here? How is he looking at this? Therefore, this is why I have And what hope he had. In fact, again, the word hope is found three times there. Someone has said, quote, the startling fact about this announcement is that it is made against one of the bleakest backgrounds in the Old Testament. It would be as if someone has stood up in one of the prison camps of the Third Reich and announced loudly, great is God's faithfulness. That might seem ludicrous enough to bring the scornful sneer of every destitute soul confined to those barracks. There is no reason to have hope through the eye gate, but there is when you're walking by faith. In fact, here are some verses you can just jot down the references, okay? The same word hope is found. Psalm 31 Verse 24, Psalm 33, 18 and 22, Psalm 38, 15, Psalm 42, verses 5 and 12, Psalm 43, verse 5, and Psalm 119, 
49, 74, 81, ran out of space, 114, 147. You can take some time later to look up those verses, and everyone has that same Hebrew word translated hope. You see, we are God's children. He sees us. He knows where we are at. We aren't invisible to him. He understands our feelings of loneliness and despair, and he promises he will never leave us nor forsake us. In fact, thinking of despair, I would have despaired. New King James fainted, unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. How did the psalmist escape despair? Unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And oh, the Lord is good, is he not? The Lord is good all the time. The Lord is good, right? And yet, oftentimes we experience situations that are difficult to understand. You know, my wife showed me a little video last week of Johnny Erickson Tata, if you know her, she experienced a diving accident, and as a result, she's had a disability since a teenager. And uh, she's a quad, and uh, very difficult situation. And she was asked by Chuck Swindoll if there were some defining moments. And one of the ones she said that was really interesting was early on after she was laying in bed there, coming to the realization she'll never walk again, she'll never do a lot of things again. She said that um, one of her girlfriends that night kind of opened the door and crawled into the room unnoticed and got into bed with her. This was a believer. And uh, apparently they had sang a lot of hymns together. And she began to sing the song. The man of sorrows, what a name. For the Son of God came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Bearing shame and scoffing, rude, in my place condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Guilty, vile, and helpless, we, spotless Lamb of God, was he. Full atonement, can it be? Hallelujah, what a Savior. Lifted up was he to die. It is finished, was his cry. Now in heaven exalted high. Hallelujah, what a Savior. When he comes, our glorious king, all his ransom home to bring, then anew his song will sing. Hallelujah, what a Savior. And she found comfort in knowing the Lord understood. The Lord had been rejected. He was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And yet he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we were healed. And also she found comfort in knowing one day it would be different. One day she'd be with the Lord. One day she'd get a new glorified body. My wife and I could hardly watch it. So we couldn't help but think about our own daughter. And the fact that one day Sarah's going to get a new body. One day I'll look thinner. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> That's my, my hope. In fact, I've oftentimes told Sarah, you know, one day, Sarah, we're going to be in heaven together. You know what I think we should do? I think we should dance. I think we should dance. It's hard to believe your dad used to know how to dance. Can't remember the moves anymore. But what a hope we have in Christ. Kind of reminded me of Gary Gardeski as he was dying here just a couple of weeks ago. Went from a stroke to death in just a few days. I'm sitting on his bedside and He's able to communicate a little bit, but not a lot. 
could shake his head. He could say some words kind of hard to understand. It was really great. I read in Romans 8, 28 through 39. At the end, he goes, amen. It was really good how he got that out. And I said, you know, this reminds me of Esther 4.14. You know, Gary, we trusted in Christ for such a time as this. This is why we got saved. We didn't want to go to hell. We wanted to go to heaven when we died. And in the meantime, we got a savior and a friend and one who sticks closer than a brother and his grace is sufficient. And, you know, and I asked Gary, no, do you, is it true you want to go home? You want to go home to Virginia? You want to go home to heaven? Are you afraid to die? Are you concerned about the process of dying? I said, yeah, it looks like you must be faith resting in the promises of God. <laughs> and he was. You know why? Because he wasn't focusing on his circumstances. He was focusing on his God. And that's why Jeremiah's turning point was when he shifted his focus from considering his own miseries to God's mercies and loyal love, which then led him to have hope. Listen to what it says, verse 22. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. Look at the word mercies and look at the words compassions and notice they come from the Lord. Through the Lord's mercies we're not consumed. The Hebrew word means completely consumed because his compassions fail not. Little play on words here. The Lord's mercies are not consumed because his compassions are never completely consumed. The first never ceases because the other one never ends. Is that how you think? Through the Lord's mercies, I am not in hell. Through the Lord's mercies, I am not yet divorced. Through the Lord's mercies, I'm still breathing air. Through the Lord's mercies, I've grown to whatever degree I have, or I've been used in whatever way I have, because what does God owe me? Nothing. It's of his mercies I'm not consumed. It's of his mercies I live even another day. And he saved me. He's kept me safe. He offers me daily fellowship. He allows me to grow in grace. He's been there for my every trial. And he's even enabled my service. And you know, this is so contrary to the entitlement thinking of today who thinks God owes us, the government owes us, everybody owes us what? If God gave you what you deserve and he gave me, he'd give us hell. But instead he gave us heaven. In fact, that's one of the things we say among ourselves as preachers. Sometimes when I hear that so-and-so is going to preach, I just say, now remember to give them heaven, I say. Because the world says, give them hell, right? We're giving them heaven. By the way, God doesn't owe you another day. Do you realize that? In fact, the average lifespan in the United States, you know how old it is for men? Average lifespan for men in the United States, anyone know? 77. That means if you're 39, you're going downhill. Did you get it? That's true. If you're 39, you're on the back side of your life. Average age for women, 81. Why do men die earlier than women? I won't go into that, okay. <laughs> if a woman is 42, that means they're going downhill. Are you redeeming the time, men? So if his mercies were not consumed, what a classic example of that is a story that Barry Helen told me how six weeks, seven weeks ago, he looked out his front porch and across the street was his neighbor lying on the porch in 40 degrees below weather. He goes over there, calls 911. He's not dead, though he's unresponsive. He ends up coming out of that, eventually with great consequence and damage done. This is a man who probably fell because he was drunk and getting in the house. And nine hours in that weather. While in the hospital, Barry and Carol make a call on him once and twice, and the guy ends up getting saved. Last Friday, I went and visited him. Here he is, probably soon to die, not sure. And I says, so do you know for sure you're going to heaven? In fact, his brother said, you know, for a guy who's looking at death, he sure seems to have a lot of peace. 
And I said, you know, Ron, as horrific as your accident was, that God used that situation to cause you to see a need and be open to the gospel. And now you're going to heaven. And he just smiles. Well, he's looking at getting his leg amputated if he's even going to survive. It's of his mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. If that wasn't enough, Jeremiah goes on to say, for they are new every morning, great is your faithfulness. New every morning. They're never exhausted. And by the way, yesterday's failures need not be today's, and yesterday's victories do not guarantee You'll be victorious today as every day is a new day to walk by faith. And you know, as I think of faithfulness, I think of Psalm 37, 4, dwell in the land and feed on his what? Faithfulness. You say, I don't know how I'm going to face such and such tomorrow. His mercies are new every morning. I don't know how I'm going to get through another day. His mercies are new every morning. I was singing to myself in the car yesterday, when morning gilds the sky. Da, 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 da. May Jesus Christ be praised. I'm told that Lewis Berry Chafer's mother sang that song to him every morning as he was getting up, reminding Lewis of the faithfulness and grace of God. And so we see the Lord's mercies are not consumed. His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. You say, what do I have to look for? The Lord is your portion. Be content with such things as you have. What do I have? For the Lord has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. By the way, it's okay to talk to your soul. Did you see that? The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Of the truth that you've stored in your soul that you can draw up at these times, the problem isn't for your soul to talk to you. The problem is when you talk back. They bring you down to Miller Dwan. Therefore, I hope in him. That's the logical conclusion of this. I hope in him. And now, can you get practical? Yes, I'll get right down to it, Jeremiah says. Number one, the Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. Now, the Lord is intrinsically good, but he's good practically to those who wait for him. This is a word for faith, to wait, to look with expectation. To the soul who seeks him. This is conditional truth. And I say this because there are those who are very big into positional truth, praise the Lord, but sometimes they imbalance. Why is it if the Lord is full of mercy? Why is it if he's so faithful? Why is it that we've been blessed with all spiritual blessings? Why is it in light of all that we are and who we are in Christ, why do some believers so miserably fail yet? It's not because of their position. It's because of a failure in their condition. It's a failure to walk by faith. Here to wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. Application number two. It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation or the deliverance of the Lord. Instead of taking things into your own hands, you're waiting quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Third application. It's good for a man to bear the yoke in his youth. Now he's actually seeing positive benefits from the sufferings he's experiencing. Because now he's factored in the Lord. He's bearing the yoke in his youth. And by the way, the word youth could speak of physical age. It's probably speaking of a time of fresh and broken strength in opposition to weakness. In other words, it's really good to learn that when you think you are strong, you are really weak. And you need the Lord. And by the way, it's even really good to go through difficult trials if those trials bring you to the Lord. 
When I see the word yoke, I always think of what the Lord says. Come to me, all you who labor and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. When you're yoked up to the Lord, guess who's carrying the burden? (laughs) When you're yoked up to the Lord, guess who's directing your path? When you're yoked up to the Lord, guess who your strength is? It's him. And thus, application number four, let him sit alone and keep silent because God has laid it on him. Stop your whining. Stop your complaining. Sit alone. Keep silent. And remember, factor the Lord in here. All things are still working together for good. See God's hand in it. And then verse 29, let him put his mouth in the dust. You know what that means, basically? It's get humble and shut up. <laughs> That's the uh, rocks or perversion of the scriptures. But that's the essence of it. Get humble and shut up. Why? Well, first of all, because the grief will eventually come to an end. You can bank on it. I had a believer who lost his wife who passed me not long ago. And his grief, when is this going to end? Is this grief going to end? I don't know, but it will. It doesn't mean there still won't be pain. You know, I was telling the story of Pastor Radke's death to someone just the other day, and I just started crying during it. Because even after 35, 40, whatever years it's been, there's still a, a pain underneath all that. Though the Lord has given me hope, it's not something I dwell on. But it touched me deep to lose my pastor and my father-in-law and my friend. But the grief does come to an end. Maybe not in this life, but it will. Furthermore, though God causes chastening or allows grief, his compassions will far outweigh any sorrow he permits in your life, and he doesn't afflict willingly. He doesn't afflict willingly. Look at verse 32. We're almost done. Hang in there. Though he causes grief, yet he will show compassion according to the multitude of his mercies, for he does not afflict willingly, nor grieve the children of men. The New English translation translates this, for he's not disposed to afflict or to grieve people. That's not what God wants to do. He doesn't want to do that. But there's the curse, and there's reaping what we've sown. And again, sometimes it's deserved, sometimes it's not. But one thing that is very clear is God does forgive our sins. And he does answer prayer when asked in faith with his will and glory in mind. He does forgive our sins. And we won't take the time to look at the verses, but there's verses that talk about that here, about confessing and knowing God forgave And by the way, you've been out of fellowship. You've been doing your own thing. You've been living in carnality. 1 John 1, 9 is always in season for fellowship. On the other hand, we're to ask in faith. We're to pray and cast that care on the Lord. We're to come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And so... Let's end where we began. Psalm 40 and verse 1, let's read it all together. I waited patiently. And if he did it for the psalmist, if he did it for Jeremiah, can do it for you. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for your word. What a comfort it is to our souls. And Father, there are many men here that are facing difficult challenges in life. Thank you that you never leave us nor forsake us. Thank you that your grace is sufficient. When it's undeserved suffering, may we be like Job and 
Just say, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. For we know that even underserved suffering has godly purposes in mind. And ultimately, for us to get to know you in a greater way and even to get to know ourselves. And Father, when it comes to deserved suffering, we know you still don't forsake us. Your mercies are still new every morning. And while indeed the consequences of sin may linger on and they may even be painful, we thank you that we can face the reality of our situation. We can admit where we are wrong. We can turn to you for your mercy. We can know your compassions fail not. We can know they're new every morning. We can know that great is your faithfulness. We can even conclude that you are good to those who, who wait for you, that it's good that we bear the yoke in our youth. It's, we can realize that one day the grief will be over. We can realize, too, that you honor prayer and you are a gracious God and you're our only refuge in this time of need. And Father, for any believers here that are just in rebellion, may they humble themselves before they reap more. May they find forgiveness in the admission of their sin to you, the claiming of your tremendous forgiveness. For those, Father, who are walking in fellowship, we know that there are many trials we're all facing, but thank you that you are with us that you give us hope. May we move beyond our feelings. May we move beyond our circumstances to see you, to see your promises, to see your attributes, and to seek you, and to wait patiently for you to deliver us and to mature us. Just comfort us with these promises. And may we take the, your word to heart even now. Father, even as we think of our country, I also bring this before you, praying again for our government leaders. As righteousness exalts a nation and sin is a reproach to any people, we pray that again righteousness would be exalted. But we pray most of all that we would look way beyond economic gains to the spiritual condition of our country and realize so many are lost and perishing and even so many believers are in a compromised state. Oh, may we be faithful. May we see big picture. May we not get caught up with the drama of it all, but be able to respond in a godly way with a bright testimony, a bold witness, a godly life. And may we be training up our children in the nurture and admonition of you and even our grandchildren. And for those that have gone astray, may we be praying for them and realize that there is still hope in you to capture their attention, to cause them to see they need you and that you are there for them. And so, Father, I pray for all of that and just thank you for this encouragement from this conference. In Jesus' name.